Hey guys, so I was planning on filming this video a little later, but I decided to do it anyway. Um, it is basically just um, an ultra video. All of the items and tools I usually have out 24-7 on my altar, and I will um, probably post a photograph or two at the end of, of my altar to um, be a little more illustrative. Um, uh, you know, let's start out. Um, first of all, First of all, I have a bit of a rant. Um, over the years, I've seen numerous photographs of other people's other people's altars, and I, I there's no way to say this without something really judgy. So I'll just say it. Um, oh, the, it, it looks like as you're green up and threw up all over their altar space. I am sorry, but Azure Green has very inexpensive, and it, it looks cheap. It, it shows that it's inexpensive. But their altar items are extremely inexpensive. They look cheap. And I believe that one's altar should be unique. I, for one, am sick and tired of seeing people that look as if they all bought their altar items from the exact same resource. Um, go out into your local neighborhood, buy some some local items to use. I I have found awesome items from thrift stores, from garage sales, from Michaels, you know, craft stores that cater to um to uh, crafts and and weddings especially. I bought a whole bunch of these. From Michaels, they are perfect for my use. Um, you know, they're they're just per perfect for throwing up a bunch of candles for a ritual for the Sabbaths. And I bought, God, I think about half a dozen, maybe eight of these, depending on how many candles I I need during a ritual. And they work really well. It's it's not that cheap brass crap from um um Azure Green. And Abyss distributions. Uh, so that was really the first set of candle holders I bought. Now the um, second um, form of candle that I bought is this one. A really nice brass candlestick. Um, it, it came as a pair. There are two. And I bought them at the will for um, I think two dollars a piece, maybe two two dollars for the set. I I forget it's been a while, and um, I'm I, I'm actually looking right now for another matching set of these. So if anyone sees a matching set to this, let me know. They retail for about seventeen dollars a piece. Um, well, at least the last time I checked. And this candle holder, this big boy, was his pewter. Um, I bought him as a set with, with one other from, um, I think, the Salvation Army. I'm not entirely sure. I, I'd have to go back to the store and, and look. But I believe it was, it was the Salvation Army. And I have a little Sal Salvation Army story to share. Oh, about... Twelve years ago, I was at a Salvation Army in downtown Des Moines, browsing on my own, and I saw they had this set of um, of dinnerware. It looked like, and I'm gonna set looked. It, it was this um, this big, beautiful um, silver chalice that had this almost Greco-Roman classical. Bacchanalian relief carving all the way around it. It was stunning. They were slowly the set, but I, I, I wanted to go back to see if they would consider separating the set. 
And when I did go back a couple weeks later, not only was that set gone, but the entire shelving unit that it was encased in was removed from the store entirely. So I asked the clerk on staff if he knew where it was or what had happened to it, and he said, in all likelihood, it was pr it had probably been moved to one of the other Salvation Armies, either in Des Moines, if not the state of Iowa. So that really narrowed it down a lot, as you can imagine. I was heartbroken because I I was thirsty for that for that chalice. It was it was the chalice of life. Oh my God! I wanted it badly. Um, oh, it, actually, it was this. It was at the same Salvation Army that I bought this, which is what I you know burned my incense and my um, parks room spells in. But speaking of chalices, and this one's actually tarnishing me badly, which is, I, I haven't even noticed how badly it's tarnishing because my room is rather poorly lit. It's on the north side of the house, and it doesn't get a lot of direct sunlight. Um, yeah, I, 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 mysteriously, my, uh, my, my silver polish has gone missing. I have no idea where it is. I used it last year. There's still plenty of it for me to polish all of my altar items, but it's, it's just gone. Along with my brass polish, which really bummed me out because, hold on, it's right back here. I bought this brass lampstand that I was going to refurbish and turn into a brand new lamp for my bedroom. Which I wanted to um, polish up with my brass polish. I turned this house upside down looking for it and it is gone. It's really, really sucks. Totally bummed me out. Uh, because I'm wanting to buy a really nice paper lampshade for it that I can decoupage or something. Oh, where was it? Oh, my chalice. This is the chalice that I use for my rituals. Although, if someone knows where I can buy a chalice, like the one depicted in Janet and Stuart Farrar's books, please let me know. I, I, I would love to find a chalice like that, because it just screams chalice to me. Actually, this is, um, this is a Judaic Kiddush cup. And I hope I pronounced that correctly. I bought it years ago from a, um, a, a Jewish supply store in Denver, Colorado. It, uh, it actually took them more than six months to um, get it to me. I, I, I had sent them a money order. Was it a money order? It, it was probably, probably a money order. And they never got back to me. I tried contacting them multiple times, and they never returned my my emails, um, which which really bummed me out because I really wanted this item, and, and it, it it wasn't horribly expensive, but it wasn't cheap either. I I think it was like um, forty or fifty dollars maybe. Um, but yeah, um, I I. Actually had a had a former friend living around the area, so they actually went to the store on my behalf when they were visiting Denver, and actually put the owners on the phone with me, which which is really really considerate. Um, and they they actually told me that they'd been trying to email me, which I find hard to believe because I never received a single email from them. Um, but I'm I'm really glad to have it. I really like it. You know, it's it's been my ritual goblet for many 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 years. And you know, actually, um, in the very near future, I plan on doing an entire video just on the deeper meanings and implications of some of the ritual tools and how I have seen some within the craft within the high priesthood even, sort of um, betray them, betray those 
There's, there's deeper implications. Uh, here is my um, patera. A patera is just an old word for an offering vessel. I actually bought this, and uh, as you can see, it also needs to be um, polished with tarnish remover. But um, a patera is just an old word for an offering vessel. It's what I use to um, place my offerings in, and sometimes even a spell working as, an, as sort of an, an offering, if you will, to the Morrigan um, during a ritual. And I've had that for five or six years, maybe, maybe more. Um, I originally had a silver plate compote bowl with scalloped sides and edges, which was really pretty. But when I when I found this at a, at a rummage sale recently, I I um I really I honestly preferred it, and I gifted my earlier offering vessel to um, to a local pagan at a um, during a um, a potluck in which we exchanged gift baskets. So I I hope she uses it. I really do. It meant a lot to me to give it to someone. And it's been used in ritual. It has been used in ritual for many, many years. Um, so you know, it, it would honestly break my heart to find that she didn't use it and didn't appreciate it, and, and um, maybe even pass it on. But whoever has it, I hope that they use it. Uh, um, I hope uh, I hope they use it well, and that it brings a, a lot of meaning to their life, as it has mine. Next is my altar pentacle. Now, when I first saw this in the catalog, or uh, online rather, I thought that it was one complete piece of metal. Well, it, it is, but I didn't, I, I wasn't really j um, jonesing on the, um, the, uh, the knot work in the metal, as you can see, the the beams of the uh, of the pentagram overlap. But as time wore on, I actually I actually really really like that that effect. It, it looks really really nice, and it doesn't bother me as it once had. Um, pentacles, altar pentacles, are actually used for. Um, well, they are the principal item on which all acts of consecration, and blessing, and even spell work are, are performed. They are the tools on which your the cakes of the Sabbath are placed for ritual blessing and consecration, and then distributed to the members of the coven. Um, but it's also an item that is used to focus and augment the ritual and the energies that have been drawn into a circle. Next we have my athame. And when I can afford to, I actually plan on passing this uh, on to someone else. And then having, well, bef um, before I pass it on, I'm going to have a custom-made athame perhaps made to honor the Morgan, maybe with a, um, a sort of raven wing motif. Um, And this is my ruby red bottle of protection potion. It's the bottle that I always pour my protection potion in. It holds easily a quarter of a cup of, or no, a half a cup of potion. And it is quite full. I have, I made some earlier this summer and it's still, I, I still, I, I use it frequently. Um, 
But I, I actually chose the this red red bottle, which I found at a local garage sale. They they wanted like five bucks for it, which is way overpriced because you could they're they're like a, a dime a dozen online. You could buy you could throw down five bucks and buy you know a, a carton of them practically. But um, you know it was it was handy and I bought it then and there. Um, but I ch uh, I really wanted the color red because it draws it's drawing in and sort of infusing the person with red light energy, which is associated with the um, with the planet Mars for defense and protection and aggression. Um, oh. And a wonderful tip is, because this was, was filled with a really nasty smelling cologne or perfume, I, I couldn't stand it, it was disgusting, to be honest, but I, um, I first dumped out the cologne, rinsed out really, really well with hot, hot, hot soapy water, I then tried the baking soda method by keeping, by, um, packing it up in baking <coughs> Excuse me, with um, baking soda for several weeks, and and that had a very slight effect on it. But what really worked really really well, even on the, well, let's see if I can get a little spilling potion all over myself. There we go. Even on the rubber insert that helps um, create a an airtight seal. Um, what you do is you simply use you simply use rubbing alcohol. It is one of the few times I actually use rubbing al alcohol regularly because what it does is if if you've bought an old perfume bottle or something that has had a lot of essential oils in it, um, a, a lot of something scented in it, it the rubbing alcohol will break down the molecular bond of the fragrance and it, it, it works really really quick you know within like a weekend of being soaked in rubbing alcohol it there is no scent left ever it it, it worked wonderfully I, I I was so happy with the with the result and this bottle I, I do have a bit of, of a bottle addiction but this bottle, some of you may recognize it. Um, back in the mid '90s, the Arizona Tea Company sold this iced coffee. Um, uh, I, I could even buy them in vending machines at the time. But they sold this iced coffee called Blue Luna Cafe, and I loved that shit. It was it was just a bomb. And I actually had a small collection of these bottles for years. Um, uh, and back then, it was it was really um, when it was just starting out in craft back in, in the mid '90s. And um, uh, you know, I, I have no idea what happened to to my small collection of bottles, but they they ended up um, just disappearing on me. And um, um, I, on a lark, I thought I would write the Arizona Tea Company because they, they don't make this product anymore, which is, which sucks because I love this this product. It was amazing. Plus, you got a really awesome bottle in the process. Um, but on, on a lark, I wrote the Arizona Tea Company, and they absolutely agreed to send me an empty bottle, which was so cool. So I just... Um, Took off the the tin cap and cut off the the little um oh the little ring that remained of, of of the cap itself and I have put on a cork and I plan on maybe probably adorning the cork with like um, some stick pins and beads and maybe some ribbons and perhaps even some glass etching on the outside I haven't quite decided but um for years it's it's just sort of been on my altar um. I've I've just been wondering what I want to do with it, and I think I have an idea of what I want to do with it. Um, it's going to require coconut oil. Um, 
in liquid form probably because it would it would it would work better for the plants for the let's say salacious plants that I have for it but um, yeah so that uh, it, it's going to be a, a magical experiment and I have uh, it's a big bottle so I definitely wanted to do something with it that would be some uh, hold something that I would need a lot of and that I would go through liberally and I absolutely ha ha have an idea for that I am I am not going to be um, disclosing that publicly because it's a little not safe for work uh, and well, actually hold on <clears throat> I also have another addiction I collect cauldrons, and each of my cauldrons, I have three, I was going to buy four, but I didn't have enough money on me last weekend to return to Michael's and buy that, um, that ceramic cauldron that they had for sale, but I actually have a, um, a penchant for ceramic cauldrons of unique styles, so if you see one, Take a, take a photo of it, let me know um, where I can get it. I will totally send you money for it. But this is the first cauldron I ever bought. It's a cast iron monstrosity. Each of my cauldrons has been dedicated to the Morgan. Because one of her aspects that we honor in the Covenant of Morgan is as a hearth goddess. And there is actually archaeological evidence of the Morgan being associated with the hearth um, and ancient cooking sites. Um, this one has been used to... It, it, it gets heavier every year, I swear. I'm just losing muscle tone. It's not even funny. But this one has been used to brew bonfire potions and even some herbal dyes. When I want a an iron mordant and I don't have any iron on hand, this works like a charm. You just boil the herbs and whatever other mordant you're using in this and it has a dulling, graying, or saddening effect onto the color of the fabric. So it's extremely useful when you feel like dyeing fabric outside. Now the first ceramic cauldron I bought was from a little antique store, or, or I think it was more like a, it would have been more like a thrift store, but they charged antique prices because it was Pella, and everything in that town is god awful expensive. How, how college students managed to thrive and survive in that town, because it is a college town, is beyond me because everything is horribly overpriced. I um, bought a new pair of shoes there because I needed them badly. My shoes literally fell off my feet as we were wa walking the town. And so I went to a shoe store there, and God, each shoe was 50 bucks. So I walked out with a pair of $100 shoes. But I did find this. It is a McCoy, well, it was originally a McCoy bean pot. They're famous for ceramics. They are the most collectible ceramics McCoy is. And it has a lovely wire bail that usually, yep, there we go, usually, um, is more willing to do what I want, but it, it, I love the wire bell. It, it originally would have had a, a lid on it, a flat lid with sort of a knobbed handle in the center. And if anyone knows where I can find one, let me know. I would gladly take that off your hands. But along with the cauldron, it came on this amazing brass tripod which I adore. It, it, it was probably originally um, supposed to hold a um, plant, a, a plant holder. In fact, it was also made by the same company, McCoy, that made the, um, the, the, the bean pot. And, you know, I, I, I just really love it. it. It makes a really wonderful impression in my temple. And this next one I bought this year. It's also McCoy. It is a part of a vintage and 
rare collection of um, citrines. It is beautiful ceramic bronze hammered motif. It's glazed. And that would just be amazing for scrying. I tell you, that, that, that coating is just gorgeous. Unfortunately, I did not have enough money for the four little bowls that went with it. This was $6, I, I believe. It, I, didn't, I didn't have enough money on me for the other four. And unusually, they actually wanted as much money for the big one as they did for the little ones, which I thought was a little improper. You know, it, they were so much smaller that I would have asked for you know at least a third the value of the big one. But that's just me. And finally, we have my most prized author item and I have to admit I've, I've actually been going through cleaning a lot of my items which I, I regularly do uh, usually with the full moon or the new moon but because I was going to be showing them off I decided to clean them a little earlier today because well actually the, the full moon is tomorrow I believe so yeah it's just like a day ahead of schedule um, Cleaning my altar items is really an act of reverence for me. And we have here this. My cult image of Morgan. It is by Dry Designs. There's there's a, a, a stick on the bottom. I, I, I had to cheat and look because for whatever reason I... I their name never wants to pop into my head, even though I adore their their artwork because it's hard to find cult images in either the um, Celtic or Norse cultures. I I won't use the word pantheon because the Celtic people didn't have a pantheon in the Hellenic and classical sense that we were sort of accustomed to thinking of in terms of polytheism. Um, but um, cult images are important in my style of worship, in the tradition of the Covenant of Morrigan, because we are an idol worshiping tradition. And I don't mean to think that this item is um, alive in the sense that I am alive. It's, it's, it, it, it's a resin cast, but it, um, it, it's not just a representation either. It's a source of power. Um, idol worship is the concept that the image in question has been ritually enlivened, in a sense, that the, um, the power of the spirit spirit, if you will, of the deity in question has been drawn down, has been invoked within the image to make it sacred. Um, in, in many cultures, if you see an image that has a, a flaw in it of any kind of crack, it, it cannot be installed into a temple. It, it is deemed unworthy of the deity. It, it, uh, a deity will never inhabit an image that has been cracked or defaced. Which is why um, Hebrews and other monotheistic cultures actually go to extremes to deface ancient images of the gods. And for those of you that love history, I love history and archaeology as well. You might be saying, but the Celts didn't didn't have idol worship. They didn't really have idols and cult images. And I can agree with that somewhat. Um, many of the idols, idols we have found have been preserved in bog and they were wooden, as with many of the idols in um, throughout the Norse territory. They're also 
largely wooden, and as you know, wood does not does not survive the ravages of time. Um, another thing worth noting is that the concept of idol worship throughout Europe in particular, as well as the, entire, the planet in general, is so widespread that if they had not had a concept of idol worship, it would have been extremely unusual. It would have been um, the exception to the rule. Which is why I am perfectly at home having an idol worshipping concept within my tradition, within the covenant and the cult of the Morgan. Hmm. But um, before I end this video, I wanted to um, just talk about one other thing that is on my altar. That I was surprised to find many other worshippers of the Morgan also have on their altars. And that is... An obsidian arrowhead. I bought this many many years ago when my best friend took me to the Iowa Historical Building which is what we call our, our local museum in downtown Des Moines. It's um, nothing really to write home about. It's it's really a very plain looking museum. Although I did learn that um, mastodons and camels actually originated in, in Iowa, or, or, or had been found um, living in Iowa before they emigrated elsewhere um, across Pangea. But um, um, I, 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 I um, paid like five bucks, I think, for this, and because I only had literally five bucks on me, I went through every box of arrowheads they had until I found the biggest one in, in the store. And when I went to pay for it, the, uh, the caster said, oh, that's a big one. <laughs> but I have been using it on my altar as sort of a devotionary gift to the Morgan. And I've been looking at it more closely lately. And the thought occurred to me that um, I should consecrate this, anoint it with a potion, and tie a... Um, tie a cord around it, around the, um, the indentations, and even wear it as a talisman of the Morgan. So that is an idea that I have had for it. Um, Roller Derby Witch actually, actually does something really awesome with, with the, the arrowheads that she has, and uh, she has one for each direction of the compass, which is a really good idea. I'm, I'm really impressed by that. Creativity, and if I had had more money, I probably would have bought more arrowheads as well. But, um, you know me, I'm a cheap bastard. So, that is my, in a nutshell, that's my temple. That Those are the items I have that have the most meaning to me. Often, I, I do change my, my altar regalia, um, depending on the Sabbaths. <clears throat> I will use different candle holders or, uh, or different colored candles. Um, oh, um, I, I do every year, every, around every May, late April or early May, I will go out and pick lilacs for the goddess. The lilacs are known as the Mayflower. Um, and the scent always reminds me of home, because every home I've ever lived at has always been within, within like, a few yard walk of a lilac bush. And it, it, it just has that meaning for me. I, I, I just adore lilacs. It's one of my favorite flowers. Um, oh, I, one of the other things I, I usually do, and a lot of what I do ritually has been influenced by Lori Cabot and her tradition. One of those is the use of black and white candles. In my altar space, uh, or atop my altar, I usually have a black candle on the left, which draws in light and energy. And I have a white candle on the right, which sends the energy you have raised within your circle, on your altar, out into the universe, to do your bidding. So that is something else that I usually do. Um, 
it 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 works well for me. It it I um it it just means it, it makes sense to me personally. Um, because I, I, I have an understanding of, of uh, quantum physics and quantum mechanics as well as um, a basis in art that I, I, I understand the concepts being put forth by her. Um, honestly, I would really like to see some of, some of your altars as well. How do you celebrate the seasons? How do you... Um, revere the goddess in your own way I would be interested to to see some of that so I will post this and probably be um, hounding down other YouTube channels as I wait for mine to upload so until next time keep calm and witch on so I had a little mishap I completely forgot to show you one of my more commonly used altar tools, and that is this. A silver plate bell that I bought from a, a, a small antique mall in Valley Junction in West Des Moines. And this also needs to be horribly polished, but I use it to, um, to summon the dead, talk to the ancestors, to, um, announce the beginning and ending of rituals to put sort of, sort of an exclamation point at certain points in a ritual. Um, it, uh, the sound of bells has also been used traditionally to banish negative energy and evil. And it, it really does, it does have a sweet sound and it's, it's not too big, it's not too small. I've seen some altar bells that are really, really tiny I like something that you can at least hold in your hand, you know, something good sized, yet not quite as big as those professional bells you see in in um in certain bands. Um, it's it's one crucial item in my opinion that everyone everyone who holds rituals often to try and acquaint themselves with. Um, I, I don't see it used as often as I would like, and usually when I do see it on someone's altar, they rarely, if ever, use it. Actually, actually, I see some altars, uh, well, one witch in particular, one witch in particular, um, who puts out her altar regalia once a year, starting in autumn as she puts out her Samhain altar and it's full of a lot of items that never go used by her whatsoever. They're, it's almost as if it's for display purposes to sort of um, show the world that she is more witchy than thou. However, we real witches tend to use our items frequently and often. So that's 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 a bit of a problem that I tend to see these days that I, I would really like to see remedy to some extent. So if you put items out on your altar, use them. That's what they're there for. They're not just to be pretty baubles or decorations to make people think that you are more of a witch than what you are. Um, Yeah, that's that's pretty much my my little rant for the day. I'll, I'll I will pr I will more than likely get back to it because I have blogged a bit about uh, about some of, some of the issues I have with many within the craft community um, over the years, and they're important to say the least. So I I will leave you there, and you know as I said before. Keep calm and witch on.